a, uh, a little bit of a delay. There's about a 30 second delay between me talking and you guys hearing me. So if you're you know, sending me a message and I, I haven't responded yet, then that is, a, uh, that is probably why. So AV Technician Pros also says no audio yet. Uh, can you, okay, so Jules has confirmed she can hear me. I think we've got it figured out. Sorry about that, guys. Who knew Facebook was so important to me in my, my various processes? Great, okay, sounds like people can hear me. So we are going to uh, start right now. Once again, thank you so much for everyone for stopping by. Cool, cool, cool. So, <laughs> once again, I want to say a huge big thank you to Stage 10 for helping us put this live stream on. They are the platform that we are currently using to live stream. Uh, last time they helped us live stream to both Facebook and YouTube, but as a lot of you probably realized, uh, Facebook has been down for approximately eight hours at this point. So that has uh, definitely thrown us for a loop, but thankfully Stage 10 makes it super easy to adjust our plans and move on. So. Welcome to this month's webinar, which is uh, about how to define and find your audience. Uh, but speaking of stage 10, really briefly, uh, if you are impressed by this webinar, and I hope you are because we had a great response last time and we loved working with our friends at stage 10, you might actually get a promo code. And by might, I mean definitely. You will definitely get a promo code at the end of this presentation to help you with all of your live streaming needs. And once Facebook goes up, it'll be even more useful. So that is gonna be coming up at the end of the hour. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. So let us get started. Uh, I'm getting notes that I'm a little bit staticky, which I don't have a plan for. So hopefully it gets a little better. Yeah, just everybody, please just keep letting me know what's going on via the YouTube comments, and I will be able to uh, make adjustments as needed. This is what happens when you do stuff live. What can we say? So, to restate, again, we are talking about how to define and find your audience, specifically your web series audience, though if some of you were here from other indie film genres, I assure you tonight's webinar is definitely going to apply to you too. So to go back a little bit, back in the good old days of television, defining a potential audience market was pretty straightforward. What age group in which areas were available at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday and looking for something to watch. But on the internet, for better or for worse, with so much content available for literally anyone to watch on their own schedules, you have to get specific if you ever want people you don't already know to watch your content. And if you're at this webinar, I'm assuming that uh, you fit that description. So I wanna encourage everyone who's watching today to go grab a pen and paper or open a separate tab or get your phone's like notebook app ready because I'm gonna be walking us through a pretty comprehensive and specific list of questions that you as creators need to answer to set yourself up for success. And if you follow along and outline your audience along with me, you won't just learn something, but you'll hopefully walk away with a handy personalized foundation to start your marketing journey with. So it sounds like everyone can hear me now, despite the internet still just not being on our side. Uh, so go grab your, your note-taking apparatus. Is that how you pluralize apparatus? Apparatus? It sounds smart and fancy, so you know what? I'm going to keep it that way. Yes, thank you again for everyone for, for sticking with us. All right, everyone got your note-taking apparatuses? And let's move on to some common audience engagement misconceptions. Because I think that we all need to get on the same page before we're actually able to really dig into what's the point and how to define an audience. So the first big misconception of audience defining is that you want the broadest possible audience, so the most amount of people can watch your content. And that's true, but not at first. You can't target a broad audience because the internet has essentially destroyed broad audiences like we mentioned. 
when there was only one delivery mechanism for narrative series, the television, and limited channels on that delivery mechanism, broad audiences were forced to watch roughly the same things due to scarcity of options. And creators, for their part, were forced to keep their content themes vague and family friendly because they didn't really have a lot of options for getting distributed. So if they wanted to get distributed, they had to go broad. But the internet has introduced the opportunity for a college campus of thousands of same age students to watch entirely different content that fits more specifically into their individual interests, even on the same evening. So targeting college students who are wanting to watch content on a Tuesday night isn't a thing anymore because college students are aware that their options are vast. And so the more specific your marketing and targeting can get, the more likely you are to find an audience that truly cares about and champions your work. And that's important, championing your work. We'll come back to that later. A college student broadly doesn't care about your work or that it might appeal to them as a college student. But for instance, a female college student with liberal leanings and a love for classic sci-fi who was reached out to as a result of all of those things might. So if you know you're being targeted or reached out to because of your interests and in something a little bit deeper than your age, sex, location, you're probably more likely to actually check something out. And that's basically the principle here. So next, niche is the killer of success, which is sort of the opposite thing of a I want the broadest possible audience. Because oftentimes people are like, why would I define an audience so, you know, niche, I'm worried that no one will see my content because I'm too niche. But the thing here that we need to remember is that you don't just want people to watch your web series. You want them to want to watch your web series. People who feel connected to your show beyond finding it appealing, i.e. people who feel as though it's made for them, which is hopefully the case if you've been paying attention so far, are far more likely to share it with their friends, they're more likely to sign up for an email newsletter or social media notifications, and are far, far more likely to give you money either in a one-time crowdfunding campaign or via a small paid subscription service every month, something like Sterable and Rich. We'll get to that later too. Niche is how you connect rather than project and will absolutely be a better place to start than any other as you start to define your audience. So next up we've got, I need to be everywhere at once. This referring to like, I need to be on every video platform, I need to be on every social media platform, and I need to be posting constantly on every channel. But you definitely don't. Take it from someone who often appears to be everywhere at once online, you do not need to, especially not at first. You just need to be where your niche audience is, which might only be one or two platforms. Why bother finding out the best Instagram hashtags if your audience actually prefers Twitter? So don't add unnecessary work for yourself. Don't stress yourself out or give yourself more work. Just focus. It'll be more beneficial for your audience definitions and your audience outreach, but it'll also just be better for you because you'll have less work to do. Win-win. Uh, another possible uh, and very common misconception is that you should only focus on one audience segment, which is going to be a, a little bit hard to avoid because tonight we're going to be talking about you know various questions you should ask yourself to define your audience. But some of you may find that you might have more than one answer to some of the questions and that's okay. And I want you to know upfront, it's okay to find more than one audience segment from this exercise. Hopefully more than one person will seem perfect for your show and as a result will require slightly tweaked marketing plans. And again, that's totally cool. You should absolutely court multiple audience segments to maximize your potential reach, but sort of in the same sense as uh, as needing to be everywhere at once, you should just try to keep it to like two or three audience segments, especially when you're still a team of like one or two people who are actually doing all of the outreach. So for an example, my zombie apocalypse rom-com web series essentially had to start catering both to horror fans and rom-com fans separately, though in both cases, the age, preferred social media, and gender of each of those audience segments remained the same. 
Both of those segments enjoyed the content, but they needed slightly different marketing materials to actually hook them. And so that's another reason why you want to define your audience early so that you know what types of marketing materials you need to make, you know, even if the, the tweaks are small to appeal to your sort of defined two or three segments. So I'm seeing some conversations about getting some lag. Uh, like I mentioned, you will get some lag. There will be about 30 seconds in between uh, when you guys are hearing me talk and when I am actually talking. I also see that there's still a little bit of static, which I'm sorry, guys, I don't, I, I can't really control that. Unfortunately, the internet is just not on our side today. Uh, but Herman says that if he refreshes the page, that is helpful. So if you're getting some lag, refresh your page and maybe that'll help kickstart it. So Chris and iGen, uh, if you are still having lag issues, then try refreshing the page and see if that helps. I will pause to, to see if that helps some things. All right, hopefully everyone's back now. So let's talk about this final pretty big uh, audience misconception, which is I think the one that a lot of you or a lot of people you know have probably thought about before. So this one, I don't need to define my audience, I just need to tell a good story. Oh boy. So this is the biggest first time filmmaker myth that I run into and as much as I don't want to bust it, for me and you, I gotta. I'm not gonna sit here and act like any ding dong with a camera can become a successful and beloved filmmaker just because they understand marketing. But I'm also not gonna act like everyone who hasn't managed to get traction for their incredible work isn't actually all that incredible. The internet, as it turns out, is not a meritocracy. And neither for that matter is Hollywood. Yes, obviously you need to tell a good story, but that's just step one. For example, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the series uh, called Binge. It uploaded its pilot about two years ago now, and within that first month got over 100,000 views on it. Uh, Binge was a dark comedy series about bulimia, and so it, it pretty quickly gained traction. However, it didn't get that traction because of an eating disorder video tag or because it was fascinating and heartbreakingly hilarious, though both of those things were true. What the pilot did well on YouTube because Angela Gullner, the co-creator and star, spent a month solid sending emails to blogs and publications and influencers and offering to write some articles herself. And about a year after that, I interviewed her to ask her sort of what their marketing thing was. And she admitted to me that by the end of their initial marketing push, after about six weeks, she was literally wearing arm braces. So don't think that just because something is great it'll get traction on its own. Finding footing online takes work outside of making great work. It's the nature of independent creation and the nature of the internet. So if telling a good story is step one, defining your audience is absolutely step two. This one is a hard pill to swallow and I understand that. And uh, if you actually want more information about that misconception or any of the other ones I've talked about, uh, make sure to email me, brie at steerable.com after the presentation today because there's actually a supplementary handout for this webinar. So if you want extra info and you, uh, you wanna get a little bit of a deeper understanding of the principles and some uh, templates for outreach to blogs and publications and stuff like that and, and outreach to fandom leaders from the fandoms you might be reaching out to as a result of this exercise, I've got templates for that and much, much more in a handout. So remember, email me at brie at .com and you can get that handout. All right, so it looks like the uh, refreshing work. So thank you, Herman, for figuring out that solution. And we are gonna move on. To repeat this statement, ultimately, you don't just want people to watch your web series. You want them to want to watch your web series. People who want to watch your web series rather than just say, yeah, all right, are gonna be a far more powerful group of people and are actually going to help you as you continue your filmmaking career. They're the people who are gonna stick around and like I mentioned earlier, give you money, follow you on Twitter, continue to be involved in your work even after a particular series has ended. Okay, so 
we are going to start with the basics. So remember, before we get into these questions, you might have a couple of answers to each of them. Go ahead and write all of the options down. And then as we continue with more questions, there's about four sections to this presentation. See which ones are the most fleshed out and use that to kind of help you prioritize. All right. The basics of audience building. And the first questions that you're going to want to ask yourself are, how old are they? Pretty standard, but you got to start somewhere. Again, you might have a couple of different audience segments, but how old do you think your audience is? Or the people who are probably going to most enjoy your work? Also, I should mention a good place to start with a lot of these questions is who are you as an audience member? Oftentimes artists forget that they themselves are their own audience. So if that's a helpful way to kind of jumpstart who you think your audience might be, start with you. So how old are you? Next, what gender do they identify as? Again, if you don't really know, think about who you are. So I am a 27 year old woman for my first two questions. And so I would probably appeal to other 27 year old women. What is their sexuality? Also very important, especially if you have uh, characters uh, along the LGBT spectrum in your series. What is their race or cultural background? And so obviously race is pretty apparent. What is the race of your potential audience segment? But what I mean by cultural background is things like, were they raised in America or were they raised in Canada or elsewhere? Were they raised by immigrants in a city, in a small town? Are they from a homogenous single ethnicity area or from an area with a lot of cultural diversity? Essentially, you're answering this to figure out your like language choices. Will your potential audience be excited by representation of their race or cultural background or do they already have it? If you determine that your audience is largely urban white men, perhaps marketing about representing urban white men isn't your best bet. So you should focus on other parts of their identity instead, which we'll get to throughout this presentation. So that's all I mean by uh, cultural background. Next, what is their socioeconomic status? So are they a broke student? Are they a mid-career, early career person? All of this is important. And finally, do they have a mental or physical disability or are they close to someone who does? So another example is if you're developing a series about like a deaf character or hard of hearing characters, you'll probably want to prioritize closed captioning or like, you know, subtitles for your series. And you might need to make some artistic choices on set, like in your production itself to make your series more accessible. So this is one of the ways, answering this question is one of the ways to sort of determine if the actual design of your show outside of the marketing materials needs to change based on who you think is going to enjoy it or watch it. So, what do you do with that information? Well, the first obvious answer is that you are making better targeted ads. So it's an unfortunate fact that we're not able to stream to Facebook today. Therefore, um, this is an uncomfortable example, but Facebook honestly has the best targeted ad booster on the internet. There, you know, Google has an okay one, but largely if you want to pay for ads, do it on Facebook. Facebook is for better or worse, really good at serving ads to people. And they give you a lot of control over the demographics of the people and profiles that you want to target to. So obviously based on this first little section of their targeted ads field, knowing the information that we just worked out from those questions is gonna be really valuable to you. You'll also be able to make those social media platform priorities better. If you know this sort of information about your audience, you'll be able to design your show better to appeal to the audience that you're reaching out to. And you'll also be able to identify organizations that are aligned with the audience you're intending to target. So social media priorities. Uh, I want to say that this is a Pew Research study, a Pew Research Center study about the use of different online platforms by different people with different demographics. Uh, if you want access to this without all of the lines that I'll use as an example in a second, again, I've got a handout for you that you will find super useful. So after the presentation, make sure to email me, 
brie at sterable.com to get the handout with this information and more. So the reason that I really enjoyed this Pew Research Center graph is that it makes it really distinct where people in your potential basic demographics are gonna be hanging out online. So for instance, if you determined that from those questions, your audience segment is black women between 18 and 24 who make between 50 to $74,000 a year, have attended college uh, and maybe a little bit more, so graduate school or an MFA program, something like that, and they are based in urban environments, so cities, LA, New York, Seattle, Portland, the most likely use platform for those people, at least social media wise, is gonna be Facebook. So that's useful. You know that based on that audience segment, you want to use Facebook. But also as a secondary one, it looks like Instagram is also a big hitter in the uh, black women between 18 and 24. So that's useful. Also on a slightly smaller degree, uh, people who have had a higher education even past undergraduate college and who live in cities also really like Twitter. So once you're deciding which platforms you want to focus on, this is a good way to start to figure out like where actually those people are. And uh, worth mentioning, actually, that one way, once you have determined your social media platform priorities, is that you can actually post all of them at once from Starable Updates. So like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, you, if you have a web series that is not currently on Starable.com, definitely submit it to us, Starable.com slash submit. I'm actually going to put it in the chat right now, Starable.com slash submit. So if you have a web series that's not terrible, definitely submit it to us, either during this presentation, I won't be too offended, or afterwards. Uh, so Cerebral Updates is a social media management tool that's exclusive to people who have pages on Cerebral. With Cerebral Updates, you are able to link to an infinite number of Facebook and Twitter accounts, for example, your show's accounts, your personal accounts, and maybe even various Twitter transmedia or uh, character transmedia accounts. You'll be able to post and or schedule an infinite number of updates to all of those platforms. You'll be able to post and or schedule longer form updates like cast or crew interviews, production diaries, festival recaps, and more straight to your terrible page to kind of centralize information. You'll be able to post locked updates for monthly paid subscribers on your show. More on that later, but essentially if you want to deliver, you know, secret rewards just for people who are giving you a little bit of money each month, you can do that with terrible updates. Uh, but in my opinion, most importantly, you can actually alert your cast and crew that a new update is up for them to help promote, which is, again, my favorite part of this. I no longer have to remember to individually harass everyone anytime like an important tweet goes out with a new trailer or a new episode or something like that. I can just easily set who needs reminding of which posts right as I schedule them. And again, to get this feature, you just need to have a show page on Starable, which is totally free. Again, head to starable.com slash submit to get that started preferably after this webinar or during a break when it's a little bit later in the, 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 the time, but I'm not your mom. Do whatever you want. Just make sure you submit your series, even if all you have is your trailer. You can have a terrible page even with just a trailer. And uh, I promise, even if you're joining just to get the terrible updates tool, it's going to be totally worth it. Also, apologies for New York City being incredibly loud in the background, but, you know, we do what we can. So the next thing that you might use that demographic information for that we just come out of is uh, designing your show on every level. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of this show, Carmilla, but if you haven't, it is a show about lesbian vampires uh, on a college campus. And obviously a big, you know, group of uh, this audience segment was queer women, specifically queer women. And as you can see from basically every level of their show design, they are explicitly promoting to women 
seeking representation of queer women on screen. So, you know, over on their Twitter account, they make sure to post a picture of the two actresses getting cozy because they want to emphasize the relationship. Uh, they're often just about to kiss or just kissing or, you know, very physically close to one another in promos for their show, for the movie that they eventually made, for the poster, everything like that. They were very, very clear on who, which audience segment they were targeting and they made sure to speak to that audience on every level of their marketing and as the show went on even more in the plotting of the show itself. And it was incredibly successful. So if you know it's good enough for you know multi-award winning Carmilla, I think it's good enough for the rest of us. Uh, like I said, another thing that you can use this information for is finding aligned organizations to help you promote with. So, for example, this show, Sam and Pat are depressed. My show. New season coming out soon. Uh, the audience segment we, or one of the audience segments that we determined for this show was asexual women who have depression or anxiety and or who have been to therapy. So, using that, just that information, the uh, sexuality, gender, and disability. From asexual, we connected with the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, or AVEN, which is the largest uh, nonprofit that serves the asexual community online. They're huge on promoting works that help explain and represent asexuality in ways that it often isn't in media. And because we have an asexual character and because the writer and star is uh, identifies as asexual, we were able to connect with AVEN and they've helped us promote on a variety of occasions. And it was only because we knew that that was an audience segment we were going after, that we could speak to them and that they were even interested in us in the first place. So second, women, the gender of our, or one of our, again, uh, audience segments. We, as a result of knowing that women were probably going to enjoy the show, especially because it co-stars and was written, created by a woman, we reached out to a group called The Light Leaks. They are a uh, platform for women and gender nonconforming filmmakers and have on multiple occasions let us do social media takeovers. They've written features about us and have helped us promote at basically every stage of this project from crowdfunding in season one to the season two premiere. So because we made sure that they knew that we were looking to reach out to women audience members and the show was created by women uh, or largely by women, The Light Leaks was interested in us and has helped us out. Finally, depression anxiety. Depression anxiety is the disability that we felt would probably enjoy this series because it is explicitly about two characters with depression and anxiety. We ended up connecting with this organization called Art with Impact, who promotes art that talks about mental health issues. And so since we are art that talks about mental health issues and we market a lot uh, to that particular audience segment, Art with Impact has helped promote our episodes and has, you know, put us on their platform and has helped us promote on social media and things like that. And I mean, I don't know how many times I can say it because we identified the types of audiences that we were after. We were able to find organizations that also fit that niche. It was really valuable and it has helped this show do far better than any of the shows that we've ever done before it. All right, so how's everybody doing? All right, not too much talking going on. How's everybody doing? I asked this like I'm gonna get a response right away, even though I have said on multiple occasions, there's a 30 second lag. You know, you'd think I'd learn, but I don't. All right, Jules says all good. So full steam ahead. The next sort of section that we're gonna talk about for defining your audience. So we're back to questions. We're back to, to filling out some question answers. Oh, we got Kai and Elle and Steve all chiming in too. Hey guys, thanks for coming. All right, looks like we got a question. Um, if it is relevant, I will answer in a little bit, but I'm gonna go full steam ahead on getting us to the next section. So what they do, what your audience does, that's the, category that we're talking about next. So where does your audience live? What life stage are they in? So I put age and life stage in different sections because I think it's important that we kind of understand that two 25-year-old women are 
possibly going to be in wildly different audience segments depending on their life stage. Some 25 year old women are mothers. Some 25 year old women are traveling the world with 20 bucks in their back pocket. Those women are probably going to need slightly different marketing to appeal to them and are probably going to be enjoying slightly different content. So understanding what life stage your audience is, is, also, is oftentimes more important than finding out what their age is. <laughs> Looks like Herman is doing marketing while watching a marketing webinar. So great job, Herman. Hashtag on brand, great job. Uh, M Corb Riv, I will answer your, I see your question and I will answer it later on. All right, so next question. What is their educational background? So you might remember from the Pew Research study chart that uh, people with different educational backgrounds tend to enjoy slightly different social media platforms. So pretty obviously knowing the edu educational background of your potential audience is going to be really important. This is also probably relevant if you're targeting uh, college students or high school students with your content. What do they do for work? So what does your uh, audience do as a job? Do they have an awesome job like doing live webinars with very loud uh, ambulance sounds in the background? Because I might be your gal and you have my email. So it's going to be super easy to connect with me. What are their hobbies? Are they into knitting and crocheting? Do they like long walks on the beach? All these things are important. All right, so again, what do we do with this information? Well, again, you can make better targeted ads. So this is another section of these, the Facebook ad manager, uh, a little further down than the like basic demographics up that we saw earlier. And as you can see, you can target people specifically by their interests because um, if you've been on Facebook for more than a year, you probably know that uh, back in the day, a lot of people used to add themselves to interest groups. So, you know, I love crocheting or things like that. And then even more modernly, they just started to list things they were interested in because the whole point of Facebook allegedly is to connect people to each other. And so a lot of people ended up kind of onboarding their interests very early on and then forgetting about it. So a lot of those people are still on there, even people in younger demographics. So being able to reach out to them based on interests that they have listed on their own profile will make it a lot easier for your ads to get to them. You can also, with this information, do a better job at targeting which film festivals you want to submit to and which screening opportunities and events you want to try and promote. Also, sort of in the same vein as um, aligned organizations is you're going to probably find a lot more affiliated interest communities to reach out to as a result of wanting to market your content. So. For example, this is a show called Or Die Trying, and it is a series that follows four women in LA navigating the creative industries, uh, not just film, but uh, writing and journalism and uh, I think photography at one point and acting and things like that. And so naturally one of their audience segments is city dwelling female creatives and freelancers. So as a result of knowing that about their audience, they would probably specifically target and have which I've seen on social media, have targeted specifically Los Angeles and New York City festivals. They also tend to target female filmmaker festivals where their, their content does really, really well because it's explicitly content made for and with women. They also tend to partner with women-owned businesses for screenings and events. So that's a, a cool new way of getting your voice and content out there is not necessarily having to go through a festival, but finding a you know female creative industry um, like agency or a female owned coffee shop or a female owned restaurant and uh, reaching out to those businesses and saying, hey, we have content specifically made by and for women. Can we partner with you to do an event? We'll promote our show, you'll promote your restaurant slash diner and everyone wins. Uh, they could also theoretically do a creative women networking event paired with a screening, which I know that they have done a version of at least. So these are all things that they can do as a result of knowing very specifically which audience segment that they're reaching out to. All of these things are cool on their own, but they are also all in service of getting more eyeballs on their series. And by eyeballs, I mean eyeballs. 
Uh, you will also probably find a lot more traction in affiliated interest communities. So this is a show called Frank and Lamar. Frank and Lamar is a comedy series set in New York City uh, about two roommates slash middle school teachers. So these are Frank and Lamar. They are the roommates slash middle school teachers. And so as a result of knowing that their uh, audience segment is probably going to be like young or early 30 something teachers who teach specifically grades six to nine affiliated interest communities they might want to reach out to include uh, the teachers and education subreddits on reddit which as you can see as i've circled have 93,000 and 78,000 respectively subscribers to those communities so they're very active communities and obviously because they are making a show about teachers they probably want to reach out to teachers because teachers would probably find humor in the sort of day-to-day -day annoyances of being a teacher. Uh, then we've got Teacher Problems, which is a Tumblr blog that allows submissions. Uh, so you can reach out to that Tumblr and say, hey, we've got a web series that pretty much explicitly talks about teacher problems in New York City. Like, would you be willing to help us promote? Uh, also, there's a Twitter account that I found. And all of this I found with like, 10 minutes of Googling like teacher communities. I just went to every social media platform, wrote teachers or teacher problems and came up with this list. Uh, and as you can see, the We Are Teachers Twitter account, which tweets all sorts of you know human interest things and blogs and articles and stuff like that. They have 46, uh, 463,000 followers. So that's a pretty substantial reach. And if you're a new show about teachers connecting with a pre-established community like that is going to be super, super useful. Uh, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the things in the handout that you can get if you email me after this presentation, brie at steerable.com, in case you've forgotten, uh, one of the sections is explicitly about how to find and get in contact with fandom leaders from these types of affiliated interest communities. Because if you're not yourself an active like Reddit or Tumblr user, you might not really know where to go. So I have made like a step-by-step -step with screenshots breakdown of how to not only find communities on Reddit, Tumblr, Twitter, et cetera, but the best ways in which to determine who is like a fandom leader and who is the people, who are the gatekeepers that you probably want to get in touch with before just randomly link spamming in these communities and how to actually go about contacting them. So super useful, something I definitely wish I had a year and a half ago. So hopefully you will find some uh, useful stuff there too. Uh, it looks like Herman has chimed in saying that Comic-Cons often have film festival attached, which is, yes, good point, Herman, an excellent opportunity for the right kind of content. So going back to our film festival screening slide briefly, uh, if your show is, let's say, uh, set in the Harry Potter universe, but based in a Canadian magic school, perhaps reaching out to Harry Potter conventions, of which there are millions and uh, comic cons and more like nerd conventions might be a good way to get your word out. So if you were a show like say The Spell Tutor uh, out now by Herman Wang, uh, that would be a good place to do. But also a lot of like superhero or, you know, uh, honestly zombie comedies and horror comedies and, and you know things of the quote unquote geek world. Oftentimes there are local comic cons that you can reach out to and, and try to have an event at. Thank you Herman for pointing that out. All right, third segment of audience definitions is what they consume. So this is when we're starting to get into like real deep fandom. Uh, and this is where the finding fandom leaders is gonna be super, super useful. So what does your audience consume? What are their favorite TV shows and movies? So based on what you know about your audience so far and more than likely what you know about yourself, what are the probably favorite TV shows and movies that are not only things that your audience probably also enjoys, but might be relevant to the uh, type of content that you're making? What are their favorite books and blogs? What are their favorite bands and podcasts? Podcasts especially, podcasts are huge these days. Uh, and just today, actually, the news broke that Gimlet Media is the first uh, podcast company to start the process of unionizing with the WGA. So big things going on in podcasting. If you can connect with podcasts, your web series is going to be very good and very successful at their marketing. So <laughs> to use this information again, better targeted ads. 
like we mentioned earlier, uh, those of you who have ever used Facebook know also that a lot of people tend to have like their favorite movies and books listed on their profile as a way to like, I don't know, tell people who they are in a succinct, easy to find way. And as a result, you can start to target people like that. So if you had, for instance, a zombie rom-com web series you were trying to make tar buy targeted ads for, you might also want to target specifically people who are already fans of zombie media, more popular zombie media, who will probably have a, a more um, positive outlook on, on other zombie media. So Zombieland, uh, the zombie run, zombie comedy, zombie castaways, like all of these things are based on what your audience already likes and you can target them specifically. Also, you can use uh, this information, what your audience consumes for better keyword and name dropping opportunities, outlet outreach options, and to bring it back to fandom, fandom communities. So outlet research. So speaking of zombie rom-coms, one of the audience segments that we had for my show Brains was people who enjoy horror and horror comedy specifically, people who read female filmmaker blogs, because our show was created and stars a woman, and uh, fans of quote unquote geek content. So as a result, the places that we had a uh, big success with in getting like press to cover us was a blog called Talk Nerdy With Us. Nerdy, zombie comedy, perfect. Promotehorror.com fans of horror and horror comedy. Uh, the other 50%, this is a podcast explicitly about female film filmmakers and we got in touch with them and they, they loved our show and they loved our idea and the fact that we were created by and star predominantly women. So we, we got a lot of success by uh, talking to them and got a lot of great new female viewers from that. Uh, and also we, we got ourselves listed on ZMDB or the zombie movie database, the IMDB for zombies, uh, you know, again, people who enjoy horror zombie comedy. We Once we knew what we were looking for, it turned out there were quite a few places we could reach out to. Uh, then again, for that same kind of segment, people who enjoy audience uh, zombie media and people who enjoy other narrative log web series like the Lizzie Bennet Diaries, which we were definitely influenced by, uh, we could do fandom outreach to the <laughs> two and then like, seven other zombie subreddits. We could reach out to the Lizzie Bennett Diaries specific Reddit because they're like, we're like, hey, Lizzie Bennett Diaries is over, but there's a new show on the block you might enjoy. It's also a rom-com just like Lizzie Bennett Diaries was, and it was shot in the same way. Similarly, there's a Tumblr blog called We Love Web Series that also naturally fits into an audience segment that we had identified, people who enjoy web series, specifically the very web series centric narrative log style. Again, this is all stuff that I found with like 10 minutes of research. I just typed the keywords that I had identified as descriptors of my audience into Google, and this is what I found. All right, so the uh, final sort of section of this presentation and the way in which you can de define your audience is, how they consume. How does your audience consume content? So where do they hang out online? You probably already determined this based on your social media platforms, but there might be something not social media specific that you learn about your audience. You know, do they like Reddit or do they prefer Tumblr or, you know, maybe uh, fan fiction forums? That's still a thing, right? I think it's still a thing. Um, you know, do they congregate in specific Facebook groups or things like that? What is their preferred, preferred viewing style? So that means like, do you think your audience prefers binging content versus getting content weekly versus getting content daily? And also, uh, what size of screen do they tend to watch on? This is now more of a con uh, conversation than ever. Some people actually predominantly consume media on their phones, which is something you can actually find out via your YouTube analytics, which type of screen is viewing your content most often. But maybe your content is often watched on like a TV, like a Roku or something like that. Knowing the preferred viewing style of your audience is gonna be really, really important. We'll get to that obviously in the, what do I do with this information slides. Uh, and so this is the final big question. What is your audience willing to pay money for? 
we'll talk about this again just a little bit, but based on the audience segments that you have built throughout this presentation, do a little bit of research. What is other content that's similar to their, to yours that is uh, monetizing either through crowdfunding or subscriptions or merchandise and see who is successful at that and what your audience is already purchasing from other places. That'll help you determine, you know, whether to do mugs or t-shirts, whether to do enamel pins or stickers. All of this is useful information for you. <laughs> so again, better targeted ads. I don't even need to put a screenshot here because I think you get the point that the most concrete way to use the information that you have hopefully developed throughout the course of this presentation is to make better targeted ads. So instead of paying money to Facebook and just hoping that everyone between the ages of 18 and 54 sees your ad, you're actually making choices that make it worth the money. Because a lot of people end up wasting money on ads that they didn't think about enough because they're like, yeah, I want to go for a broad audience. Niche is the killer of success, right? And they end up just kind of throwing their ads into the void and connecting with people who are not really in their audience segments, especially not right at first. Uh, but also all of these things will be able to help you determine the distribution methods for your show, the technical format of your show, and smarter monetization strategies. So technical format. If your audience is probably gonna watch your content on a phone or more often on a phone, you're probably gonna wanna stick to, if you're gonna do a wide shot, closer up wide shots and you know ultra close ups on characters because the screen is small and you wanna make sure that they're really picking up on the nuances of what you're doing. Whereas if you think that your audience probably watches on larger screens, so laptop or larger, you might get away with sort of broader, wider shots that are a little bit more um, cinematic. And you might be able to get away with having a lot more information on screen that they can kind of pick apart because their screen is also as big as, uh, you know, the information that you're giving them. Also, smarter monetization. So these, once again, very brief research done on uh, on Patreon and um, Twitch. So I just found three people who are making content similar to mine, female filmmakers, and um, saw what they were doing for their two to five dollar monthly tiers. And there's a pretty obvious sort of overlap in the type of content that people like me are you know, monetizing at one to $5 a month. And usually it's just ex access to an exclusive feed. So that's useful for me to know because if that's something that is successful for all of these people who I consider my peers in content, even if I'm not necessarily at their level yet, this is good for me to know, to know that, okay, my audience is already willing to pay one to $5 a month for exclusive access to a feed, to just little pieces of information just to get to know me. And so I can then turn that information into something that I do on, say, Sterable and Rich. Promised I'd get to it. And uh, if you've heard about this before, I apologize, but it's worth reiterating, Sterable and Rich is awesome. And since our last webinar, it's actually gone live for everyone on Sterable.com. If you are in the US or Canada, you now have, and have a page on Sterable.com, again, uh, get one at Sterable.com slash submit. You now have access to Sterable and Rich, which uh, empowers creators to offer freemium versions of their content. So fans can support the shows that they love. With one link, your Sterable page, creators can share both their existing free content. So you can see that down here a free unlocked content and offer paid subscriptions to access exclusive premium content. That exclusive premium content is right here. So to give you a little bit of a closer look, uh, once you click this uh, support button up in the top of your, your page, if you choose to set up Enrich, which I strongly encourage you to do, you can become, uh, you, you can set up something like this. So you can have two tiers for your show, uh, two different monthly repeating payment tiers and offer specific things. So these are examples of uh, what you might put at different levels. You can also then add a one-time donation there at the bottom. So lots of options. And if you've been paying attention and defining your audience in the most you know niche and specific of terms, hopefully you'll be able to use that information to inform the amounts that you charge for things and what things you're charging for. So finally, this is sort of a bonus section of how to define your audience. 
But this is something that a lot of people, I think, overlook, especially when they start to do um, basic research for where they might want to reach out to. So oftentimes, searching for a potential audience problem, what's their problem, will reveal tons of new opportunities for promoting and will also give you insight into the and to how to frame the marketing materials that you're making. If you're solving one or many problems, you're not just promoting something that this audience will potentially enjoy, but something that they need something that they need to solve a problem. So examples of problems include lack of or lackluster representation in media, lack of or lackluster information and education about a particular thing, missing a canceled or finished piece of media. So for example, I miss Firefly. Why isn't there more content like Firefly? Well, you can answer. If you miss Firefly, maybe check out this web series as an example. Um, maybe your potential audience is frustrated with their job or career. So go to back in, going back to the or die trying example, it was about millennial women working in creative industries. And um, I think we're all on the same page about the fact that most people in creative industries are often frustrated with their job slash career. And so that's potentially a problem that your content can either solve or speak to for them. Uh, they also might be frustrated with a relationship or friendship or angry about culture or politics or current events. All of this is super useful information for, uh, for you to know. Again, if you can speak to this stuff, if you can solve these problems, that's a really great way of marketing your content. So for example, Carmilla, going back to Carmilla, lesbian vampires. They were obviously speaking to and marketing to the fact that there is a lack of lesbian and non-binary representation in media. And so all of their content and all of their marketing focus on the fact that they were filling this void. That's a great way to speak to people. Hey, do you not see yourself reflected in media? Well, maybe this show is the answer to that. On Sam and Pat are depressed, we're answering the problems of lack of asexual representation, a lack of information and representation about living with mental illness, and the very, very common feeling of being frustrated with your roommate. So we can market to the effect of all of those things. And there are people who are frustrated by all of these things that definitely uh, have found solace in being seen through our web series. And then also, um, as a final example, Frank and Lamar, to bring it back. So they are obviously speaking to a lack of African-American representation in media, people who are frustrated with their career, in this case, teaching. But I think more broadly, they can probably reach out to people who feel stagnant in a career, uh, frustrated with, quote unquote, well-meaning white people slash white culture. That's something that gets brought up a lot in their series. You know, they're, they're two of the only minority teachers at their middle school that they teach at. And that often creates some uncomfortable things. And I'm sure that's a problem that a lot of other, um, you know, minority professionals have. And I bet that they would be really seen by those episodes. And so that's a potential way that Frank and Lamar and the creators behind it can speak to an audience uh, and also frustrated with shitty students. So going back to those blogs for, you know, hashtag teacher problems, if they, you know, use a teacher problems community to post their sort of comedic take on how to deal with frustrating students, that's a great way to speak truth to a problem that other people are having and allow people to feel seen. All right, so we are almost at the end. And if you are skeptical, you are not alone. About a year ago, I posted a sort of early version of this presentation in the form of an article. And uh, John, who is awesome, he uh, created the show Killing It, he was a little bit skeptical. He wrote this comment on that post, and he says that he feels that all this stuff is dead on, but when he looks to his own interests, he doesn't find that they align with his demographic identity at all. Mostly, he's caught by a show when he feels for the characters and is happy to be transported into a world that he's unfamiliar with. So I said, all right, that's super fair. I totally understand why you might or might not uh, feel like you're, you know, male in his 20s and early 30s is being spoken to by the marketing materials and the stuff that you did. So I put a question to him. I asked him, what is content that you've discovered recently that you did not find as a result of somebody telling you about it? Because obviously uh, the best way to get information around and to get a new piece of content in front of you is to be recommended it by a friend. But in the cases where that's not possible, I asked him to give you some examples of content that he found recently. And again, content that wasn't that didn't come to him via a friend's recommendation. So these were some of the examples he sent me. 
So he recently got into Pacific Coast Native Art, which he discovered as a result of the Hall of Native Peoples in the Museum of Natural History in New York City. He was walking around that museum, came across it, and then got really into Pacific Coast Native Art. He also got into the television show Poldark. He said he found this because his girlfriend and he just kept the TV on after watching Downton Abbey, which is a, a common practice in their household. They love Downton Abbey, kept the TV on, and oh, look, what's this Poldark thing? Uh, he also had recently gotten into the Hamilton soundtrack, which even a year ago was super late in the game to get into the Hamilton soundtrack. And he said that he got into it because of the quote unquote Pence thing. And if you are not familiar, uh, the musical Hamilton had a special guest about a year and a half ago now, and it was Vice President Mike Pence, who, you know, is traditionally not known for enjoying diverse people art experiences. And he got like booed by the audience. And uh, one of the actors had like a really impassioned speech about you know, acceptance and all of this stuff. And Mike Pence walked out. And so that obviously had a pretty big spectacle. And that's how Jonathan found out about the, the musical. He also enjoyed it, uh, you know, after he looked at it because of the Pence thing, he, he sticked around because he enjoyed and had nostalgia for late 90s pop and hip hop music. So I was like, great, this is a good starting point. So then I broke it down for him. So Pacific Coast Native Art. If Pacific Coast Native Art was looking to define a marketing segment for themselves and wanted to do some more outreach, they would probably define their audience as people who enjoy or go to museums. So using the audience brackets, what they do, and specifically what your audience's hobbies are. So an example of a way that Pacific Coast Native Art artists could use this information would be to partner with a museum to promote their work set up a co-hosted live event with the museum, you know, maybe using their lobby or something as a screening hub and uh, also potentially hooking it up with like museum donations or something to benefit both. Um, and then they would also have to ask themselves which online communities are there for people who go to or enjoy museums. There is definitely a community or probably five online specifically about people who enjoy going to museums as a result of me knowing that Jonathan found out about them because he enjoys going to museums. So that would be a way that Pacific Coast Native Art could have marketed to him based on the audience demographics that he gave me. Next up, Poldark, the television show on BBC. Uh, so this audience segment based on how Jonathan found out about it was probably people who enjoy Downton Abbey and historical fiction. So going back to the question of what they consume, specifically what are their favorite television shows and movies. So. What Poldark could do if, you know, Aiden Turner, Aiden Turner was just some nobody is that they could start tagging their marketing content with Downton Abbey keywords. I don't know what those are because I am not a part of this audience segment, but if you are or know someone who is, maybe you have a better idea. They would also be able to look at how Downton Abbey is promoting and either piggyback on or do their own spin on a Downton Abbey marketing thing. That way you're sort of appealing to something that people already recognize as something that they like and they might be intrigued. Also, again, online communities. There are definitely on kind, online communities specifically about people who enjoy historical fiction media. So those are all examples of, based on how Jonathan found Poldark, how Poldark could find more audience members like him. Finally, Hamilton and the Hamilton soundtrack. Now, as we know, Hamilton is super down on its luck. It's not doing very well in the theaters. So based on how Jonathan found out about them, their audience segment would probably be liberals. So. What is their political affiliation from the basics questions we asked ourselves? People who are interested in politics, current events, and who enjoy late 90s pop and hip hop music. All of those things being an umbrella answers to what they consume. So one way that the failing musical Hamilton could promote their work is to do in-character analyses of current political events through the eyes of the historical figures played by the actors who portray those historical figures in Hamilton. They could also do sort of topical mini hip hop about current events while in costume. Again, based on the fact that Jonathan found out about this musical because there was a political event that happened around it, they could really, you know, capitalize on that and use that to spur more attention to their content. Uh, so back when I originally made this presentation, the galaxy brain meme was a lot more popular, but to kind of wrap this all up, if we're looking at a show like the Lizzie Bennet Diaries, which a lot of people know of, because it was the first YouTube distributed series to win an Emmy, uh, to go through each stage of this audience definition thing. The basics are their audience segment would probably be 15 to 25 year old women 
who are college or grad school students whose hobbies may include baking or crocheting or blogging. They probably consume classic literature, AKA Pride and Prejudice, rom-coms more specifically, bloggers, so people who spoke to YouTube cameras or YouTube cameras, spoke to video cameras and didn't have a lot of you know high production element stuff. Uh, and they also probably enjoyed YA novels and how they consume is this audience segment probably watches most of their content on their phone or on their laptop. They use YouTube, Twitter, and Tumblr as their primary social media platforms and are often Patreon subscribers of video bloggers. So if the Lizzie Bennet Diaries, the uh, similarly to Hamilton failing Lizzie Bennet Diaries, oh, poor Emmy winning show, uh, was having trouble targeting their audience, this would be a great way of breaking down and starting to figure out where they want to head to uh, get more eyeballs on their content. And that's it for me. So it's time for promo time. Thanks for sticking with me, everybody. So uh, if you haven't heard, Sterable Fest is back. Our, it'll be our second annual Indie TV Festival. And because you've stuck with me for so long, which I really appreciate, you can get 15% off a submission to Sterable Fest 2019 by heading to filmfreeway.com slash Fest. So you can submit a web series, a, a longer form pilot, or even just a 90 second pitch. And if you use the promo code Sterable Meetup 2019 with the uh, caps, uh, it, it is cap sensitive, so capital S, capital M, Sterable Meetup 2019. You put that in at checkout, you'll get 15% off your submission. Speaking of promo codes that are cap sensitive, if you have enjoyed this webinar tonight and you want the ability to manage a live stream more efficiently and be able to stream to multiple places if Facebook ever works again, and honestly, are we really going to be sad if Facebook doesn't work again? I'm getting off topic. You can get two free months of stage 10 using the promo code STERABLE FREE for two. So the caps are important here. So that's capital S STERABLE FREE, all caps, for F-O-R, lowercase, T-W-O, all caps. Or just look at the picture on the screen. If you sign up for any Stage 10 paid plan, you will get your first two months free, which is worth up to $684. So that's an incredible deal. Listen, the Sterable Fest deal is good. It is not $684 US dollars good. You just need to go sign up at stage10.tv. Once you're logged in, you should select, quote, upgrade plan in the top right of your screen, enter your billing information, and then put in that promo code before confirming your subscription. So if you do that, again, sign up on stage10.tv, go to upgrade plan in the top right and enter your billing information along with the promo code you can see on this screen. You're gonna get two months free of honestly the best live streaming platform I've ever used. I love stage 10, they're so helpful. They're so down to help you figure out what's the best way to use webinars to do accomplish whatever goal you have set out for yourself and uh, super sweet dudes and it's just a great platform. So highly recommend them, could not recommend them enough. Definitely check out Stage 10. And that's it for me. So this is all my information and I'm gonna take like a two minute break to go get a little bit of water so that I can answer all of your questions. So. That is my information. And remember, so this is my email address, brie at steerable.com. If you email that email address after the webinar today, I will be able to send you a handout with a bunch of uh, extra information that'll help you on your audience defining and finding journey. So I'm going to cut off the audio on purpose for a second, uh, go get a drink of water. And uh, if you want to ask questions about this webinar or about anything I've talked about tonight, start adding them in the uh, live chat and I will get to them in a couple of minutes.
Hello again, it's my face. Uh, welcome back from our minute and a half break. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna hop over and see some questions. So first question came in from M. Corb Riv. If you want that pronounced a different way, please let me know. Um, but you had a question a little bit earlier in the presentation and you asked, did you usually receive support from the organizations by pitching the show to them or after producing an episode or two? So in the examples that I used, um, I already had at least an episode or two out, but um, sometimes organizations have like a, a blog or something like that. Monica, call you Monica. Hello, Monica. Thank you for your question. Uh, so yeah, in your, in, in your uh, question about organizations, I did generally have an episode, but again, sometimes they have a like written portion of their website for features about you know current events that are relevant to that organization, things like that. And so you don't always necessarily have to have a piece of content produced. You do, if you're promoting a show, you should probably have something to promote to them. Uh, you know, whether that is uh, a trailer, a crowdfunding link, or, you know, something else like that, because they need something to latch onto. And the whole point of this exercise is for you to market your show. But you don't have to have too much content at first. If you are especially a member of the community that you're marketing to, so for example, I suffer from anxiety and depression. And so when I reach out to like mental health blogs and people like that, I can speak to my own experience and say, as a person with depression who is also a filmmaker, I have, you know, lots of things to say about this. And so I would, I, I, I think I would be a great interview for you. Uh, and if you have questions about how to like talk to people like that or how to kind of reach out to people that you might want to pitch yourself to, whether or not you have a ton of content to pitch at the moment, uh, definitely email me after the present. Uh, yeah, after this presentation, and my uh, handout will have a couple of templates that you can use to get started, so you don't have to completely come up with everything from scratch. Uh, another question we got from Jules. Thank you, Jules. Jules asks, any tips for making promo material slash images when you don't have a cast yet, so you don't have images of the characters to make posters or edits of? Uh, and Monica already sent me an email. You're so efficient. You're awesome. Do you have a terrible page? Uh, if you have a, a trailer for your web series or even a teaser, you can have a terrible page and get access to all of the wonderful things that I talked about tonight. Terrible.com slash submit. Uh, but on to Jules's question. So promo material and images uh, are not necessarily contingent upon cast. Actually, a lot of times my promo materials have a lot less to do with cast and crew, especially in the beginning when you know they are. I are, I'm not able to coordinate with them. So uh, for example, Jules, I know that you create your own materials, uh, you write and direct and things like that. So making promotional materials around yourself might feel a little bit narcissistic, but you are part of the package. And that's something I think people forget a lot in web series is that because your relationship with your audience is so much more tangible, like right now, I'm literally talking to you, the audience, live on YouTube. I have a much more intimate uh, relationship with you right now than you know Felicia Day does on Supernatural. So because of that, myself and my beautiful visage is a lot more a part of the marketing package than uh, you know behind the scenes people in modern television would be. So as a result, use that. Use who you are and what makes you special and the work that you've done before as part of your marketing to get people behind the project. Uh, other things you can do is use snippets from the script. So making marketing materials, like have character quotes, even before the characters have had a chance to say it on screen, if you have a really good line of dialogue that you think is like indicative of the series as a whole and what audiences can expect, use that to um, you know promote things. You can also reveal your logo and any sort of like graphic design that you've had to do for the show for promotional materials or even for like production design and use that as part of your images. I see Herman just put in that he interacted people um, interacted with people when designing their logo and font. That's cool. Involving your audience as you develop marketing materials. That's a cool idea. You could probably do that live using stage 10. It'll allow you to do things like have this super cool like lower third to give extra information or you could do like a picture in picture. So as you're designing, you can also have like you and your cast and crew in the corner so that we can see both the design happening and also the cool people behind it. That's another option. 
Uh, but yeah, just get creative with the materials that you already have on hand just to make the show. Because you probably have tons of materials on hand far before you have a cast or crew to attach to them. Be that wardrobe ideas, the script itself, uh, logos, uh, location photos, things like that. There's a lot of options. Uh, and if you want to talk more about that, definitely get in contact with me after the presentation. And I'd be happy to talk some stuff through with you or go back and check out our webinar from last month where we talked about creating supplementary content. A lot of the stuff that I brought up in that presentation didn't require cast or crew. It was just stuff that you could do by yourself in your room. Uh, do we have any other questions? I know we had uh, Steve and Eldam and Kai who stopped in earlier. Uh, I know Chris, Chris Sartorius was here earlier. Any of you guys got any questions? Oh, wait, I'm going to take myself off. I'm going to put the uh, email back on screen so that you guys can have access to that and be able to easily, easily refer to that. The other links on here, if you aren't familiar with Starable, are starable.com, our main uh, web series platform. That's where you can find all the cool tools like our social media management tool and Starable Enrich, which helps you monetize. Uh, that's starable.com. And if you want to submit your show, again, starable.com slash submit. Also, community.starable.com is where I know a lot of people have found out about us before. Uh, that is our filmmaker forum where thousands of filmmakers from all over the world go to ask questions, offer advice, write helpful articles. Like, for instance, Herman, who's been in the comments all today, has a series of articles on community.starable.com called VFX 101. His series is a Harry Potter related series and so they had to do a lot of magical special effects and he has a lot of great articles breaking down exactly how to do those things even if you don't really have a budget and then finally podcast.starable.com is the link to spoiler alert our podcast called forget the box which i also host so if you have enjoyed my uh you know sultry tones th this evening then you're probably going to enjoy our, our podcast so if you go to podcast.starable.com you'll be able to find all of the episodes that we release the first one being with actually lizzie bennett diaries co uh, creator bernie sue so definitely get in on that all right it doesn't look like any other questions are coming in i will stay and vamp for a little bit if anyone has follow-up questions um but if you don't feel comfortable asking questions via this forum please please feel free to reach out to me after the presentation briatserable.com everyone who knows me can attest that you can uh always reach me via email i am listen i'm an i'm an internet gremlin and I can't not be on the internet. So if you need to get in contact with me, it is very easy and I would love to help you out. Ooh, Monica has a follow-up. Monica asks, can you customize ads per episode? Yes, so if you are not familiar with uh, the Facebook ads manager, basically you, you are promoting, uh, you're, you're making an ad of posts. So for instance, if you were going to upload either a teaser or the full version of an episode to Facebook natively, which you should, you should never put YouTube links on Facebook because Facebook hates that and will like deprioritize it on everyone's timelines. Always upload natively to Facebook. Uh, so then what you do is every time you upload a teaser, if you don't want to all put all of your content on Facebook, just like a snippet of it, you upload it just as a normal post. This is a teaser for episode two. And then once that post is live, you'll go to boost post and you um, will then from the boost post screen, be able to do all of the targeting for each individual episode. And that's actually a great point, Monica, to, uh, to, to target specific audiences with specific episodes. So for instance, going back to my show, Seven Pattern Depressed, uh, I mentioned that one of our audience segments is asexual women. However, not every episode talks about asexuality. But in episode eight of season one, we had a whole episode specifically about coming out to your therapist, which is, you know, pretty specific type of topic that isn't necessarily as specific in other episodes of the series. So we promoted that episode kind of separately because it had a totally new potential for audience engagement. So I would recommend actually, if you're going to be doing small targeted ads per episode to try and mix it up in terms of which audience you're reaching out to. Like for example, it sounds like yours. So your series, um, say your series is for one thing but can target different demographics per episode. Yes, I would definitely recommend doing that. You'll also be able to start seeing which ads you're getting more traction on and that might help you 
make better, smarter decisions as you move forward. There's no shame in realizing that an audience you've defined just isn't working out or just isn't being reached the way that you are currently trying to reach them. So, you know, having this kind of stuff in your back pocket and being able to see what's changing is going to be really valuable. Uh, Kai says, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here, Kai. Kai, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, send me an email, brie at steerable.com. So I will stick around until 8.30, which at the time that I am saying this, is it is 8.27. So I got a couple of couple of minutes left. If anyone has any final questions about steerable, about defining and finding your audience, or about me, your enigmatic host, let me know. And I will stick around for a couple more minutes to answer all of these questions. Also, apologies to everyone who RSVP'd on Facebook and then wasn't able to make it because Facebook went down the day, the one day a month that we're doing a webinar. Hopefully, when Facebook goes back up, we will post this link and you will you will uh, get to experience it, albeit a little bit later, with the rest of us. Good night, Herman. Uh, oh, Jules has a question. So Jules says, are there any steerable events coming up that we should know about? Jules, that is a great question. And I feel like as much as I would love for that to be super candid, uh, I have to admit, Jules is a personal friend of Sterable, uh, as was actually our intern for a while. She attended the first Sterable Fest with us and helped us run that smoothly. So thank you, Jules, for the great question. Uh, and yes, there are a couple of Sterable events coming up that you should know about. So first of all, if you're based in LA, I will be speaking at Hollyweb Fest uh, on March 29th. Yes, March 29th, which is a Friday at 10 a.m. I will be doing a presentation similar to this one at Hollyweb that you can come hang out with me at. Or if you're just going to be at Hollyweb, uh, I will be probably bumming around for most of that festival. So come and say hi or send me an email and say that you're going to be there. And uh, also, if you are based in Portland, Oregon, or know a filmmaker who is, I will be in Portland, Oregon next weekend. So uh, March 23rd, where I will be also hosting a uh, actually in-person, just casual meetup. We're going to get coffee in, in Portland, you know, classic Portland behavior. And so if you know anyone in Portland or you are yourself in Portland, Oregon, please stop by. I would love to see you. All right, guys. I think it looks like people are, are logging off and going to bed, and I am very jealous of that. So once again, I'm going to go through our promos. So if you have a web series, a pilot or a great idea for a web series or pilot, you can use the discount code Sterable Meetup 2019, uh, cap sensitive, to get 15% off your submission. Uh, regular deadline ends at the end of this month. So if you wanna make that 15% go the farthest, definitely submit soon, like in the next two weeks soon. Go to filmfreeway.com slash Sterablefest to uh, claim that discount code. And then also, if you're interested in live streaming, which I hope you are, uh, we've actually not only gotten uh, written a couple of articles that will help you do a live stream like this or potentially a little bit lower in, uh, impact than this, resource impact than this, you can get two free months of stage 10 using the discount code, code Sterable Free for two. Also cap sensitive, so make sure you're paying attention to your screen for what is capitalized. Just head to stage10.tv, make an account, and when you go to upgrade plan in the top right of your screen, you can enter your billing information along with the promo code, again, sterable free for two, before confirming your subscription for two months free. It's absolutely worth it. Please take advantage of this. I, you will not be disappointed. I love stage 10. Thank you again, stage 10, for making this possible. And even though we weren't able to use you to the full extent and power of your platform because Facebook has failed us again <laughs> for a totally new thing, uh, we love working with you guys and thank you so much for making this possible. So, cool, Monica might see me in LA. Awesome, awesome. Eldom, we will hopefully have a New York City event coming up soon. So if you follow us on Twitter, at Sterable, or you sign up for our newsletter, um, email me and I'll help you sign up for our newsletter. You will get, you'll be one of the first people to know that a New York City event has been scheduled. So just stay in touch with us and we will, uh, we will get connected. So thanks so much everybody for being here. Thanks again to Stage 10 for making this possible. 
and uh, I will see you guys soon. Good night, everyone.